this talk is called what to do in the off season. Um, you know, I've been involved in small party politics for a while. Um, oh, I've got a, I've got a kid bumping in. Okay, sweetie. See, this is what makes the American Solidarity Party so great is that when, oh my gosh, how did you do this? All right. <laughs> when there's a knot in a bathing suit, we're able to uh, be child friendly and sort of shut it down. Kiddo, I think you're gonna have to get yourself out of this mess. Hey, I'm doing a presentation. Do you think you're gonna ask Bill to help? All right, thanks, sweetie. All right, thanks everyone, apologies. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the first and won't be the last there. So what to do in the off season, right? Everyone comes in and there's this big burst of energy whenever there's a presidential election and we get a flood of new members and people joining the Facebook groups and wanting to volunteer. And then things sort of trickle off and go sort of in that direction. And then we may have, you know, success, getting you know a couple of, of local campaigns off the ground but really things then lie dormant um, and the torch is carried by the same group of core super dedicated activists which we owe a huge debt of gratitude for um, working their tails off 24 7 um, outside of their their jobs to advance the party and they keep things alive for the next presidential election and we've seen good growth from successive four-year elections onwards. A huge growth from 2016 to 2020. Brian Carroll, Amar getting 40,000 votes. That is just insane. And playing a big role, 50% uh, of the responsibility for tipping Wisconsin to Biden uh, went to, or maybe to Trump, I forget, but went to the ASP. Uh, because if you add up the ASP share of the vote and the Constitution Party's share of the vote, in Wisconsin, which was one of those super, super tight races, that's what tipped it. That's what tipped it. So this presentation is going to be about trying to raise the, the wave from here and then four years to keeping it on a, on a steady traction of growth in terms of energy and things we can do to advance. So let's get into it. First thing is, there is no off-season. Guess what? There are 43 mayoral elections in 2021, 22 counties and 71 cities holding local municipal elections here in 2021. This is the oh, okay. That's part of the swimsuit. That's great, sweetie. I'm giving a presentation right now, so run along now. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. <laughs> swimsuits, you know, also swimsuits. Uh, New Jersey and Virginia are having state level elections as well. And now that's just in 2021, right? So 2022, there's going to be similar, if not more. Plus we've got midterms, 2023, same amount. And then that gets us into the next presidential race. So this is a huge opportunity to remember that there is no off season. And one of the critical metrics that we should be looking at for our sustained success is percent of total races in an election year in which there is an ASP candidate on the ballot. So the most important thing you can do is run. And the most common objection to that, right, if it's going to be people's trade-off for making that decision is going to be the expected value um, on the one side and how easy it is to achieve that value versus the perceived difficulty in going for it. And running for office is something a lot of people don't think they know how to do. I think it's hard, complicated. There's all these things you might have to learn. You might have to go out and raise money, et cetera, et cetera. Guess what? You don't have to do it. Paper candidates, I am asking you, you to be a paper candidate for the ASP if your city is holding an election this year. You, because ballot access and practice in getting ballot access is huge, um, and it is free advertising. Elections and driving traffic to getting our name out there and then driving traffic to Wikipedia and Ballotpedia has been the single largest source of ASP web traffic 
in the last four years. Uh, there's been great work from our data crunchers team or subgroup um, led by Desmond on doing that. If any of you guys are data heads, get in there and join us. So that's a huge part of it. Um, if you can, if you know sometimes as, as few as 50 people that can sign your papers, that's enough to get your name on the ballot on election day. You don't have to go knock on doors if you don't want to. You don't have to pay for pamphlets or literature if you don't want to. Just getting your name and the name of the American Solidarity Party on that piece of paper is a huge, huge win, if you ask me. But if you're a little bit more ambitious and you want to give a go of it, local seats are winnable. And it's not just the ASP's experience, but there was a great panel last night about ASP members who've held and are currently holding local office. But the experience of all third parties show the only, the, the, the largest amount of wins by far have come at the local level because voter turnout is low. And so when you get a targeted group of people who are super, super motivated um, by an alternate set of viewpoints, you can, you can flip things, right? So that's the most important thing you can do. The second thing you can do is scream your head off. And this is part one. So the ASP platform is super, super unique um in 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 fitting into this venn diagram here between things that are good all of our policies they're excellent policies uh they should be adopted by everyone they're fantastic policies to put it in in trump level language the things that we should prioritize screaming our head off about are the things that no one cares about that are also good things a perfect example is light pollution uh, one of the more esoteric planks in the ASP platform, but super important, super good. Also something that no one cares about. Compare that to pro-life politics. Ending abortion would be fantastic. It would be amazing, a miracle, a historical world-changing event. But that space is so saturated with advocacy. The addition of 500 extra activists to that fight is not going to, it might move the needle 0.05% or something, but that same amount of energy devoted to making noise about light pollution, especially to at a local level, or if we target on specific states and go point by point, can have a huge, huge impact. And we can do that 24-7. We can do that year round. So we can channel that energy into all of these different places. Um, and perfect examples are as well, focusing on what you can control. The state means to most people, that the, the most common ways we experience the state in our day-to-day -day lives, the tip of the spear, if you will, are I believe the school district and the police precinct. And there is so much work that you can achieve at those levels. So for schools, right, a key part of the ASP agenda is agricultural policy, localism, communitarianism. And for example, switching the food supply chain from mass produced crap to stuff that's grown by people in your own community, organic farmers, uh, makes our systems more resi resilient, better creation care, all that good stuff. School districts are major purchasers of food. And they are also very, very responsive to direct democracy and initiatives like this. So there are entire organizations who built out the framework and the model policies to make it so that schools are required to purchase food from local farms. And we can go and get those wins any day, right? Um, and there's tons of additional stuff that you could do. That's just one example at the school district level. Same with the police precinct, right? What a perfect example and thing to focus on with all the turmoil and conversation we've had about our completely militarized robocop, you know, uh, boot, jackboot in your face sort of cop uh, departments that we've created over the last 10, 20 years. We can fight for community policing protocols in our own neighborhoods. It's a, a huge example um, that's really, really doable, right? Again, a place to, to channel our energy, right? Um, 
and let's zoom out. It's not just the local level. Let's talk about working with Congress for a second, right? Um, the so I've got a little bit of a of a joking uh, point on this slide because we can't bribe our Congress people, um, at least according to the. To, to the law as written, plenty of people seem to to do. If I'm judging by any of the sort of scandal stories that, that trickle out year by year, but we can't really just bribe people to do what we want. Um, some more is the pity. It might be a little easier because then we just have to fundraise. But you can give donations, uh, which are totally not a, an economic transaction in order to gain access which is not the same thing as a guaranteed uptick of your policy, but uh, it's as close as we can get. Now, you might think that that's sort of out of reach, right? That's, that's the field that big money competes on, right? But that's not exactly true. The average donation of a PAC in an election cycle at the congressional level is between 800 and a thousand dollars that is in this lens not that not that much money in order to be able to get the ear of senior congressional staff or a sit down with your congressman so that's just one example of an effective way to again if we're focusing on the policies in the middle of that venn diagram move the needle at the federal level and uh, there's one additional tool we've created at Catholic Social Action. Um, let me go out of full screen here and give you guys an example. A great way of focusing our interactions with Congress people is through a legislative scorecard. So this is a behind the scenes view at a legislative scorecard we're creating in order to assess every Congress person uh, against uh, their voting records, against the stated positions of Catholic social teaching, um, as expressed by traditional principles and specific legislative positions that have been taken on by the bishops, bishops' conferences. So we've got a, a widget here where you can find your reps uh, and contact them directly from this page. I live in, in Pittsburgh, so these are targeted to me, right? Then we can scroll down, and what we've done is highlighted so far uh, over 75 pieces of federal legislation across the following categories, right, that relate to the solidarity principles perfectly expressed here. And we've, we're the only group that we know of who are tracking a usury section, um, which is fantastic. And then we assign all of these pieces a vote rating and an additional rating for people who sponsor or co-sponsor them. And we weight the issues according to moving the needle. So obviously votes on abortion are uh, weighted more heavily than something like um, an endangered species bill, something like that. And that gives us some interesting data on people in Congress that we can contact who are highly at the end of the spectrum that, that align with us. And no one's gonna be surprised to see Dan Lipinski up here at the top. We've talked a lot about him. Um, unfortunately, he just got booted out, but the next three down are Republicans. And then we've got some uh, representatives from the squad who even though they are pro-choice are super far towards a solidarity perspective than most sort of centrist corporate Dems and Republicans, right? Um, and the data tell us some interesting things here, but you can focus your report by your representative and say, when you get that meeting, say you pull together an $800 donation um, across your, your team of local solidarians, and you can go there and say, hey, you're, you're doing great, Elise. We really applaud you on your approach to life issues. But we'd encourage you to think a little bit more broadly about what those mean, because 
you're not moving the needle on health care, you're not moving the needle on democratic reform, solidarity with the poor, and you can sort of guide those conversations using this scorecard and the Venn diagram that we've talked about to get access and to move the needle. And I've seen a million examples of if you're focusing on stuff like this, which is not going to be immediately opposed by big money. Uh, Congress people do want to respond to their constituents. It, it, sometimes it's hard to believe, but it, it's true. Um, so I encourage you to, to form a strategy in your local state chapters for pursuing that. I also want to talk about screaming your head off a little bit more. So the two examples of how to do this crucially important activity um, because what we're about is, is advancing our agenda, right? If one of, or the other or both parties took up all of our policy platforms and put them into action, I think we'd all feel comfortable uh, disbanding as a party and just enjoying the, the, the just regime and the advancement of the common good that, that we were able to advocate for. Um, I don't think any of us expect that to happen anytime soon, but some, another thing we can do, no matter if there's an election locally, is keep pushing our principles in the public sphere. And there's two ways we can sort of go about it. So we've got the war of ideas, the more high level intellectual approach to talking about our policy. So that's something we do at our subsidiary think tank, the Solidarity Policy Center. Um, we run a podcast and produce uh, white papers and policy briefs from a solidarity friendly agenda. Um, and we've had a number of, of ASP friendly and, and member guests on our podcast, as well as collaboration with some of the fellows and the National Committee on common policy work we can do. Uh, I encourage you guys to stick around and listen to Patrick Harris and myself interview Lyman Stone, who's one of the foremost experts worldwide on child policy and birth rates, um, pro-family policy. And I wanna also give a special shout out to the American Commons, which is a solidarity inspired web magazine that just launched earlier this year as a great example of some of the work on this level. But not to be too cynical, but even more important is propaganda. I'm a huge fan of propaganda, even though it's a bit of, you, the word is used a bit pejoratively. Here is an example from the early 20th century from uh, the Christian Democratic Party in Italy. I love that language, right? Stay away from the Bolshevists, stay away from the fascists, vote Democrazia Cristiana, right? Uh, the guy bearing the flag for this currently uh, is Amar Patel. I would post you, I would direct you to his amazing catalog of memes that he's developed and is uh, dutifully pumping out across the various ASP social media channels, um, focusing on uh, sound bites is and simple ideas is follow the money, right? See what the big dogs are doing. I'm, I'm going to show you guys a quick example here. So let me go to, I'm sure you guys have all heard of the Heritage, the Heritage Foundation, right? One of the big, big conservative policy shops on uh, Washington, right? The reject critical race theory. Great, glad we're spending time on the, uh, the important stuff. But this is their action and advocacy arm, right? So they've got a little brief here about the specific issue. And they're a huge inspiration actually for me in building out our projects. Um, I just want to use this, this format for good instead of for uh, a, a, two, a true mixed bag. But look at these, they've got talking points for their activists um, that are all just a couple of hundred words long. They've got a call script here for when you're calling your local representatives. And they've got social media posts that are ready made with with colorful gra graphics with just a few words for you to start pumping out over the airwaves and look they've even got these ready-made very simple very dumbed down graphics for you to ready to, to pump out we need to start creating this stuff across every rhetorical mode of expression for our policies 
and start fighting on that ground. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge believer in the importance of that. And lastly, because I'm coming up on time here and I promised I would leave time for questions, is the importance of thinking of ourselves as fighting a war in as much as I know a bunch of pacifists and peace lovers thinking of themselves as fighting a war, right? But we're waging the moral equivalent of war, to borrow a term from a famous foreign policy essay of the turn of the century. And we've got to think of ourselves strategically as on that level. So one example that I'm going to share with you is a project that Amar and I have been working on for a while. Here is a heat map of or a real a snapshot of the zip codes that we have ASP members in across the country. So uh, California as a chapter has been super good about putting up congressional and gubernatorial candidates. Look how many members we have there, right? And then no surprise, we see lots of clusters around city centers. Look how many uh, red dots we have here up in the local seaboard. Now, the great thing about this GIS tool is that we can do things like come around and look at, look around Allentown here. The, we can add different layers on top of this. So let's plug in something like school district boundaries. And let's get a little closer here on, here we go, Allentown and neighboring folks. Now, you know, you might not think, oh gosh, how are, how are we ever gonna do this? But look, this gives us a guide of where to prioritize. We're not gonna go to Albany Township School District. We're gonna start in Allentown. And these guys, these dots don't just represent a single voter, they represent a, a node in a network, in a social network. Um, so we can connect them. And then what are the odds that each of these people know a minimum of 250 people in the local area, right? What are the odds that they know a bunch of parents, or maybe even someone on school district or within a couple of degrees of, of separation? They're super high, right? And then uh, we can do the same thing for police precincts. But I'm coming up on time, so I'm not going to do that. But this is just an example of the sort of thing that we can do by being a small, nimble insurgent force. The, the, the old big dogs aren't nimble enough to incorporate this sort of thing into any sort of coherent, targeted, strategic action. But we are, and so that's what we should do. So anyway, I'm coming up on time. I'm going to get off my soapbox here. Uh, I'm going to stop the screen share and turn it over to questions. Uh, but just to review, these are all things that we can start working on without needing to become different people, without needing additional access or, or training. We can start doing it as soon as we make the decision and exercise a little bit of our willpower. So it is within what we can control, which is always a great thing to focus on, the serenity prayer. And they are things we can do day in and day out, week after week, month after month, cycle after cycle. And they are going to keep us nice and, sh and, and in shape for when we fight those larger electoral battlegrounds. So that's my pitch. That's my, my, my bag to you to keep doing that stuff. And questions, take, take them on any topic. Don't be shy. What is a good place to make memes, a tool as it were? So if we're talking about, you know, borrowing the internet meme language specifically, um, you can use, there's a few websites you can do. Um, I'll put a couple of links in the chat. There's one to like, meme generators if you want to see what's going on and uh, do that sort of thing. The other thing, if we're going to take a, a broader definition of memetics and propaganda, like if we're focusing on, on visuals, 
right? One thing that you can do to design posters and stuff, a great tool, we use it is canva.com. It really democratizes graphic design and, and pretty questions. The, the other thing though, is that the memetics aren't just related to visuals. Posting and, and acquiring 30 second video clips of people expressing their viewpoint that counts right and then you can propagate that seeing these sorts of things from people in their district has been proven by political science to generate higher response rates from officials um, as well as make more effective landing pages and things like that for survey campaigns and all the and, and social media posts all this sort of stuff so those are just a couple examples um, and, and anyone can contact me if they want to talk about that a little more. Let's see, the next question from Mary Catherine. Hi, Mary Catherine. Um, what are the best ways to drum up interest for people who aren't politically involved? That is a great question. And the there is no easy way to do it. Um, it, it involves a lot, uh, it involves work, it involves work across a number of different dimensions, but we have an advantage in being communitarian. Um, so we can have a much broader definition of politically involved. People often care and can be rallied a lot more around a school board issue or creating a sidewalk in an area that's only car accessible than they are in thinking about macroeconomic policy. But th those have to start from, well, there's two modes and, and both are effective, right? Simply campaigning people and doing literature distributions and knocking on doors and telling people about the ASP, that's super effective, right? And, but you also need to be involved in your community. Communitarians need to create community first and foremost. So be someone who invites and knows the, na knows the names of everyone on your block and organizes things like potlucks and block parties, um, cleanups of the local park, sending gifts to people who move in or, or organizing casseroles. And another great way to, to do this is through the parish. And as it all ties together, this sort of evangelization thing. So. I hope that sort of helps answer that question a little bit. Next up, we've got from Merharwi. Merharwi, sorry, I'm butchering your name probably. How can we increase our outreach to the working classes? That is another great question and something that comes up a lot. The There are a few ways to go about it. The So starting from addressing issues that the working class cares a lot about that aren't being addressed. So that is the sweet spot where you can get traction at a theoretical level. But in order to truly connect with people, you need to be able to speak their own language and to speak to them on their own terms and on their own turf. So it sort of helps if you are already working class yourself or embedded in some of those communities. If you aren't, the most effective thing is to reach out to community leaders who are deeply involved with the working class. Find opportunities for partnership. Um, it, reviving a strong labor movement, super important. Uh, so those are just a couple, couple exam examples there. But I think at a party level as well, as we're creating these policy documents and our communication strategy, we have a real opportunity to class that around language that is, is truly working class in a way that the DSA types can't fully capture because they're totally, um, totally committed to sexual libertarianism and you know sort of abstract socialist theories of autonomy and, and blah 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 um and, and we're just more down to earth and working class people tend to be down to earth themselves all 
realized I just want to go back to the meme question for a second because I accidentally shared my links just to the solidarity channel. So what was the next question? What was the, from David Hoffman, thanks David, what was the tool I could use to connect with other ASP members near me? So the tool that I was screen sharing isn't specifically a, a place that our members can find um, folks. That it's a sort of back end strategic planning docu uh, platform, if you will, uh, like, a, like a war map. But the easiest way to, to connect with other ASP, ASP members near you is to contact and get involved with your state chapter. Uh, they will have a great handle on everyone in the state and spe more specifically the counties that they're based in and can correct, connect you directly with those people via Facebook or via email. Uh, so that's the best way to go, starting local meetup groups in your area. That's all been super successful. I hope that answers your question a bit. Okay, what else, gang? Oh, snap, there he is. <laughs> oh my gosh. I sensed there was a little bit of a lull, and I figured, why not say hi? Yeah, what's going on, dude? Yeah, I, I'm I'm in the role of producer this morning, so I, uh, you know, I've been in the background for a couple of events, and you know, I really appreciate your your thoughts on this. I think one of the things that I'm going to let you, I'm going to direct this to you, but I think when people say, you know, what can you do, um, the the panel last night, and if anyone in the in the attendance was there were three uh, ASP members who have held some sort of elected position in their in their small town area. And uh, listening to that, I was inspired to just check out what was available in my own town um, and not even elected. I mean, so I actually saw some vacancies on town uh, boards and then like in advisory councils. Uh, and, you know, well, the one that was vacant was like on zoning or whatever. And that might appeal to people. I mean, that would be something that I would not want to do. That's like the last thing I'd want to be involved in. But uh, one of the uh, boards was um, economic development, right? And one of the panelists said, you know, you don't have to get elected. Just go to these meetings, uh, you know, and you'll find out, you know, in the background and kind of what's going on in your town and, and uh, you make relationships. And well, one of the points was that you know, this, someone's going to ask you if you keep going to these meetings, you know, maybe even the first time he's like, well, you know, who are you and what are you doing here? But if you keep going, the, you're going to form relationships by accident. You know, someone said, you know, how do you get people that are not politically involved, involved? Well, you know, it's always about building relationships. And obviously, if people are in town council meetings, they're already politically involved. But if you find out what's going on, then as you said, you know, those issues, those big macroeconomic issues maybe not be may not be pertinent, but you find out about stuff that's going on at these meetings in your hometown, bring it to your neighbors. All of a sudden, they may want to get somewhat politically involved, right? They're not going to necessarily want to go marching down the streets of your big city or Washington, DC, but they may want to make some phone calls and talk to their neighbors about some hometown issue. Uh, and that's the beginning of people realizing that they do have a voice and that they are able to make a difference. So, uh, you know, I think in, in between elections, uh, you know, we as Americans are kind of lulled to sleep thinking, well, there's not much to do, but the real important things are, are done on the streets of your town. And so I was inspired. That was a great uh, panel. And I think what you're talking about, kind of putting those two things together, you know, makes me consider those kind of opportunities. I think that's a great point. Yeah, I just so echo listening to that panel last night. Um, and and yeah, just to, to put you at ease, it is super easy to break into those local political communities. Um, the, the amount of people who know who is on town council and show up to those meetings, for example, or care, is super small and there are often people who have been embedded in the community for a while and don't have strong ideological commitments and are generally open to um, 
grabbing a beer or, or something like that. You know, a, a good friend of mine moved out to Bedford County in the U.S. Uh, to work as their local Latin teacher at the public high school. And just by uh, going to the local pub uh, in the center of town, a super small town, uh, you know, half the town council were just regulars at that pub and just sort of pushed into doing it by the path of least resistance. And he ended up on the town council himself just from being around and, and talking to people. It, it, can, it can be that easy. It really can. Yeah, and I, I like like your your discussion on propaganda. That was <laughs> yeah. So so, Mark, what what tips do you have for the meme wars? Yeah, you know uh, the thing that I do, and you know, I kind of get a lot of emails, uh, subscribe to a lot of different like newsletters, and obviously I'll sift through Twitter and Facebook, and and uh, you know, I don't try to read too deeply, and I don't really engage too much in conversation and like in a back and forth. I think people spend so much time getting into these uh, arguments, uh, you know, we've discussed this many times that I'm a, I'm a real believer of scale, you know, and you can create something that a lot of people will look at uh, and think about, you know, I mean, people always want to have a conversation and an argument or whatever. And it's like, I'm not sure if that changes anybody's mind, but at least people start, you know, you plant seeds, right? And so if I see a quote that I really like, I'll just take it, you know, I, you know, you turn me on to Canva, you know, and you, just, you can take it, you can get a picture, uh, you know, off the internet, you throw it on one side and you put the quote on the other side and you just download, you know, it'll, he'll turn it into a, a graphic, a, a JPEG or whatever. And then you, you share that and, and uh, you know, you might get some comments, you might get some likes or whatever, but if you, if it was a meaningful quote to you, more than likely it'll be a meaningful quote to your friends, right. Or to other members of the ASP or whatever, wherever you share it at. Um, and, you know, I've, I can't tell you how many times people have shared something and, when I see it, I'll put it on the main page, right? Or I might, maybe I'll dress it up a little bit more. Um, but some of our best, uh, most successful shares have been things that I found off of other members because they said, hey, this is cool, you know? And, and I would never have found that if you didn't share it. So if everyone was sharing kind of more ideas and um, especially like those, those quotes or, or articles that, that really get to the heart of the matter and what we're about, um, the only way we can all see that and think about it is if we're sharing that because, you know, there's no other way for us to, to find that in our busy lives. 